Okay, so um, I think we are going to get started. So, um, dear colleagues, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. It depends where you are. You are on the globe. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on extractable pathogen adsorption for the treatment of bloodstream infections in the critical care. Uh, my name is Professor Thomas Rimelet. I am an anesthetist and intensivist working in Lyon, and I'm very happy to uh, to, uh, me, to be the moderator of this uh, symposium. The, our host tonight is the um, Xterra company who uh, promotes the uh, device, uh, the Seraf, and we're gonna talk about the Seraf uh, device for blood purification uh, tonight. Uh, we're gonna have two uh, international speakers uh, after a brief introduction. Um, so we're gonna have a first uh, Professor Jan Kilstein, who is the Director of Nephrology, Rheumatology and Blood Purification at the Academic Teaching Hospital in Braunschweig in Germany. And then we're gonna have Dr. Céline Monard, who is also working in Lyon with me at the Edouard Ayo Hospital. So um, just for a few minutes, I will, uh, I will speak a little bit about the blood purification concept. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. And um, I would like to say first that, you know, for uh, the last uh, almost 100 years ago, um, <coughs> we had Sir William Osler who uh, told us that except on few occasions, the patient appears to die from the body's response to infection rather than from the infection itself. This was, I think, the birth of the blood purification concept. It's not a new concept. It's been 100 years that we talk about this. And what are we talking about? We are talking about that when there is an infection insult, the body has a response with a double inflammatory response. First of all, we have this um, pro-inflammatory response uh, during the first hours after the uh, bacterial insult. And then after a few hours, we have this anti-inflammatory response, this immunosuppression state, which is extremely deleterious for the patient because at that moment of the sepsis time course, the patient cannot fight against nosocomial infections, cannot fight against viral reactivations. These two states are uh, due to the release of all these uh, mediators. You have cytokines, you have dams and PAMs. And uh, I think the whole idea is to, uh, pro to propose some extractable devices which are able to restore, to modulate this inflammatory response in order to restore this immune homeostasis. Um, this, um, this is extremely important because uh, even in the sepsis definition proposed by the surviving sepsis campaign a few years ago, the reference to this immunology component of our work in the ICU is, uh, uh, is given. Look at the first sentence of this sepsis definition. Sepsis should be defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection, which means that we need to work on this uh, modulation of the host response. Um, at this time in the ICU, we need to know about immunology. That was true in the past, but I think we were not so much aware about that. Today with this uh, new, uh, drugs that are able to uh, work on the status of the immunologic status of this the patient this blood prefixion concept we need to uh, to have a lot of knowledge on immunology in the icu so we have all these uh, devices proposed for uh, blood purification and uh, i think i have uh, separated them into four categories you have all the solvents Polymix in behemoth perfusion, uh, cytosorb uh, device, LPS adsorber, the, the HA330 from, 
from China and uh, the biosyn technology also. These are hemoperfusion devices. They are able to remove from the blood cytokines. They are able to remove from the blood endotoxins for some of them. The second category of blood purification devices are um, the blood purification devices, which are at the same time a renal replacement therapy uh, device, which means like, uh, like the Oxaris filter from, from Baxter Company, the PMMA, uh, these are high adsorptive hemofiltration uh, renal replacement therapies filter. And we have the high, high cutoff membranes, the AMIC2 membrane from the Fresenius Medical Care Company. These are filters who also are able to modulate this inflammatory response, able to remove endotoxins and cytokines uh, after uh, um, like a uh, um, um, a response from the from the body um, on during an infection, and then we have this. Uh, in the past, we have here on the uh, here other techniques: high volume of filtration, cascade of filtration, plasma exchanges, coupled plasma filtration adsorption are also some techniques to uh, modulate inflammatory response, but they are not so much used anymore. Today in 2022, we have these new blood purification therapies. And today we are going to talk about the Seraph from uh, the Extra Medical Company. These new devices are able to remove from the blood some leukocytes, but also some bacteria or virus removal. Today, today we are going to talk about this uh, bacteria and virus removal, which can be extremely interesting uh, at this time uh, for uh, the fight against these uh, uh, severe infections. Um, so the questions I would like to um, ask to our two experts tonight, what makes the Seraph such a unique and promising therapy? What is the current evidence in the scientific literature and how to use the therapy in clinical practice? So if these our two experts tonight can answer this question. That would be uh, extremely uh, good. Last but not least, I, I, I want to share this thought with you. Um, we are going to talk about some very interesting uh, devices able to do some stuff that we could not imagine in the past. And I think it's very important that we should keep in mind that we have to be careful that the, the technology is moving very fast. We have like, it's like um, cell phones, you know, it's going very fast. The, the technological progress is moving very fast. Our scientific medical knowledge is not going that fast. So we have an increasing gap between our, the medical knowledge and the technological progress. So I think it's important to continue to do research because we need to be able to answer the questions how do these therapy exactly interfere with sepsis pathophysiology? It's important to understand how these devices work exactly. Which patients exactly? We need to select uh, the right patients who will benefit the most of these therapies. When do we need to start these therapies? And what is the most important to remove? Really the bacteria, the cytokines, the endotoxins, I think all these questions are extremely important and we have to keep in mind this. Having said that, I think now uh, I would like to ask Professor Jan Kirstein to give the first talk for uh, tonight during 20 minutes. And then we're gonna have Celine for uh, 20 minutes as well. And then we're gonna keep 10 to 15 minutes for an interesting discussion. Uh, you will be able to ask questions to our experts. You have two options for that. The Q&A function on the uh, Zoom software or the chat function. I will keep an eye on the chat and we, I will ask the question for you if necessary. Thank you very much for being here. And Jan, you, have, uh, you can give your speech now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for this uh, nice uh, introduction to our uh, today's uh, webinar. And um, 
I will um, hopefully be able to start um, soon the remote control here. Uh, here we go. Well, so my task today is to speak about extracorporeal pathogen adsorption for the treatment of bloodstream infections in critically ill uh, patients. And um, these are my conflicts of interest. Um, and uh, with that, I think we go right to, to uh, the first slide that gives you an overview about uh, the session uh, today. I will start to talk about the fast reduction of pathogens and why would that be an appealing concept. Well, the first study I could uh, dig up uh, here is more than 100 years old, uh, and it uh, established very nicely the uh, correlation between the pathogen burden and the mortality. And this classical experiment uh, um, was performed in a way that pneumococci were installed in the bronchial system of rabbits. And you can see, depending on the number of bacteria, you either have no mortality or a 100% mortality. And um, this observation is true uh, unto this uh, very day. The higher the burden of the pathogen, the higher is the morbidity or the mortality uh, we are um, having. Well, for a long period of time, uh, um, we thought uh, we have it all. We have antibiotics. Uh, the Vin, uh, the 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 uh, the Dwayne the Rock Johnson uh, power type of medication that can take care of every uh, infection we're having, and then we learned a couple of things. The first thing we learned was that it really does matter when, after the start of the infection, you start the treatment with your antibiotics. Uh, this is. Uh, uh, a seminal uh, slide shown on every ICU conference showing you the survival fraction um, uh, that is depending on the time uh, of uh, uh, antibiotic treatment start. And what you can appreciate is from the get-go, you cannot save everybody, but even the 80 plus percent uh, of hypo. Uh, uh, hypotensive patients with a fulminant infection that you could save, we do not save because we delay the onset of uh, um, uh, antibiotic treatment. And with every hour um, uh, that it takes longer to start that treatment that is now in the sepsis bundle among uh, measuring lactate and among taking blood cultures and giving fluids, uh, with every hour delay, you increase mortality. Well, we don't have the gold mark anymore. Uh, we have the euro, and I'm really happy um, uh, to have the euro. Um, uh, and uh, I'm happy we have this um, uh, French-German uh, uh, collaboration here tonight. Um, but uh, the gold mark should just remind you that there is a golden hour that is uh, present. So. Um, you know, it really pays off to be very fast in the beginning of uh, a fulminant infection and treat with antibiotics. Well, the other problem, uh, aside from uh, timing, is that we have uh, increasing um, resistance uh, to antibiotics. So um, multi-resistant organisms or difficult to treat organisms are on the rise. And that of course leaves uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, our antibiotics a little bit powerless. Um, and so the question arises, uh, what else uh, could we offer? Uh, and you can a little bit compare that to uh, safety of modern cars. Today, anti-lock brakes are standard in uh, uh, most uh, of the cars in the world. Uh, but uh, in the 70s, when they were introduced, it was such an increase in safety to uh, uh, the motor vehicle uh, that everybody was re reporting about that. and. Um, so the, the, the question is, did we stop there? 
And of course, no, we didn't stop there. We continue to do that um, uh, by um, uh, doing more and more uh, research um, and um, then continuing um, uh, finding other ways to um, uh, to um, um, go above and beyond antibiotic treatment. And what you can appreciate here is uh, a publication from uh, the 80s from Russia. And uh, these colleagues were the first that came up with the idea to um, uh, uh, take um, bacteria out of the circulation by uh, treating them with a charcoal cartridge. Uh, they were aiming to do that for diagnostic reasons, but I think uh, everybody has to give them credit with first describing the idea to remove pathogens from the blood uh, with activated charcoal. Um, I don't have to explain that to this audience why activated charcoal is not a very good idea in uh, patients nowadays anymore, uh, but there are sh uh, bright ideas how to remove pathogens. This one is a very appealing uh, idea that was published four years ago. It's about uh, bendable nanowires. And those nanowires uh, kind of capture bacteria like um, the, uh, an old toothbrush and uh, they close um, um, uh, the bacteria in so that you have a kind of a venous trap uh, that uh, first binds the bacteria and then um, um, prevents um, the bacteria from um, moving on further. And uh, if you would pump blood over the spendable nanowires, you could imagine that uh, this would be helpful to eliminate bacteria. Uh, this idea never made it to market so far, but you can see the idea is prevalent. So, um, uh, what about uh, this little fellow here, the great crested grebe? How, how does that relate to pathogen removal? Well, what we do have on the surface of our cells is a seagrass kind of structure. It's uh, the glycocalyx. And uh, um, as in nature with the seagrass, uh, it, it has pretty much of the same uh, purpose. So um, uh, you can hide um, uh, in between the, uh, the, the seagrass and it kind of uh, gives you not only visual pr protection, but also mechanical uh, protection from, um, uh, from other animals. And um, uh, we have seagrass on our, the surface of our cells for regulatory purposes. So cell processes, adhesion processes are regulated via the glycocalyx. And um, um, the main uh, compound uh, that we do have there um, is uh, heparan sulfate. And you can see that here in the cartoon uh, that now leaves uh, the big picture of nature and focuses on, on a single cell. On the surface of the cell, you have the peptide backbone of, uh, and, um, of the proteoglycan and then attach the heparan sulfate. And bacteria and viruses bind by nature to the heparan sulfate. And now comes the really sharp translation of this principle into a therapeutic uh, option. Um, so um, the idea of the seraph is to mimic nature uh, by um, coating a non-porous uh, media with heparin. And heparin doesn't on, not only sound very much like heparin, but it has the same charge and structure. So what happens is that if you pump blood over this non-porous seraph media that is covered with heparin, viruses and bacteria attach to uh, that heparin as they would usually do to the heparin sulfate on the surface of cells. So this is the underlying principle how this uh, pathogen magnet, uh, if you will, works uh, in vivo. So this is an in vitro uh, estimation how many bacteria and viruses attach to the seraph material uh, through, uh, through one pass. 
Uh, this is important to notice that this is in vitro, and I'm sure we're going to have uh, many, many papers coming out in the next weeks and months uh, um, uh, trying to replicate that in vivo. And um, um, uh, I know uh, for sure that uh, out of Zurich, uh, Sasha Davis will probably report on, on some viruses and their actual binding um, um, and... Um, uh, that's going to be very interesting to see whether or not this uh, reflects the in vitro binding that is illustrated on, on this summary slide here. So what do we have in terms of clinical data and ongoing studies? So the first in human study was one uh, performed in hemodialysis patients, hemodialysis patients that had a bacterial infection. The drawback of that first in man study was that uh, for regulatory purposes, the positivity of the blood culture needed to be confirmed first before um, being able to, um, uh, to have informed consent to participate in the study. So what happened in those 15 patients is that it took um, sometimes almost 200 hours from the draw of the blood culture until the actual treatment with the seraph. And uh, this is, of course, uh, um, an untoward uh, delay, and it, it, it kind of violates the pathophysiological principle that I just introduced that you should, in a fulminant infection, uh, start treatment hard and early and not late. But may it as it be, um, we gained some insight into the uh, SARA function with that phase one study. We did see no effect on heart rate, systolic or uh, diastolic blood pressure, which is interesting because these were all infected patients and usually you see a drop in blood pressure during dialysis. What we registered, which was uh, unfortunately not part of, of uh, uh, the primary endpoint, was uh, increase in oxygen saturation um, that uh, uh, we did observe in those patients. When you look at other um, uh, blood markers, no effect on uh, of this treatment on white blood count or hemoglobin or platelet count. So this is uh, especially the platelet count is markedly different from. Uh, from charcoal hemoperfusion, you know that charcoal hemoperfusion will dramatically decrease platelet counts. There was a little drop in antithrombin activity, but fibrinogen uh, stayed uh, stable. And we can go on and on. Uh, it's important to um, uh, show this slide that uh, um, immunoglobulins or a total protein or albumin uh, is not affected, and the same holds true for liver function tests. Um, the readout or the, the, the uh, secondary endpoint of that study, the primary was safety, uh, was efficacy. And what we did was to measure the time to positivity um, in those patients. Uh, when you uh, recall that time to positivity is inversely correlated to the number of bacteria. So if you have a lot of bacteria, you have a very short time to positivity when your blood culture comes back positive. If you have a low number of bacteria, you have a long time to positivity. And what you can appreciate if you uh, compare pre and post time to positivities, pre and post um, uh, time to positivity uh, in the um, um, in in those patients is that you can see that um, uh, there is a tendency to increase time to positivity uh, in three patients and um, uh, in one there there isn't. The problem is you sh what you should actually do is to translate time to positivity. Uh, to the colony forming units. And um, uh, this is done in this publication where they uh, do show that uh, a small change in the time to positivity uh, can give you a lock difference in the colony forming units. So the data I just showed you 
um, have to be interpreted uh, with that having um, in mind. Um, I show you a single case that was really impressive uh, to us, um, uh, um, a renal transplant patient with a failing graft and um, with multiple um, uh, cutaneous lesions and staph aureus infection that was uh, properly treated uh, with uh, resistogram tailored antibiotic treatment. And what you can appreciate here is when we uh, used hemoperfusion in that patient that uh, the treatment started with uh, still positive blood culture, time to positivity was 26 hours. And when um, at five minutes of treatment, when we took the blood sample right after the seraph, the blood culture was negative. So we repeated that after two hours, and you can see that after two hours, the time to positivity increased from 26 to 28 hours. So the number of bacteria obviously decreased. And again, uh, if you compare the pre and post seraph blood culture uh, samples, you see the blood cultures uh, um, uh, um, um, after the seraph in the venous blood, if you will, they were negative. After four hours of treatment, even the pre seraph blood samples, the arterial blood samples were negative um, and uh, they stayed negative uh, for uh, uh, the following days. So obviously in this patient, the addition of the seraph to antibiotic treatment, and this is how it should be used. It's not instead of anti-infective treatment, it's on top of anti-infective treatment um, did work. Um, and this is the bloody obvious test uh, with electron microscopy. You can see uh, staph aureus adhering to the seraph material. We also use the seraph in the setting of COVID-19 because we have learned that uh, the uh, more serious your, uh, the COVID condition is, the more likely is the fact that you have viremia um, uh, outlined in this graph. So uh, about 75% of all the ICU population with severe COVID have uh, viremia. Uh, and this is not RNEmia, it's real viremia as um, uh, evidenced by this paper that uh, was just published uh, uh, last year um, showing live viral uh, um, particles um, uh, adjacent to the platelets uh, of, um, uh, of a patient here. Uh, we could show that there is a, a viral uh, nucleocapsid clearance of the seraph that is really depending on the uh, viral burden. So if you have a lot of virus in the blood, there seems to be a higher clearance of that virus. And we used a normal protein as a control. And what you can see on the right side, uh, your normal whole blood protein is not affected. It's uh, just uh, the uh, uh, COF2, SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein that is removed. Um, in order to uh, look at uh, treatment uh, with the seraph, we established uh, a registry, COSA, COVID-19 patients treated with seraph 100 microbind affinity filter. It's an online registry that is not reimbursed. Uh, so far, uh, we had uh, the first report of 78 patients um, uh, published in NDT. Uh, and what you can appreciate, of course, uh, patients with um, uh, um, um, adverse outcome um, had higher inflammatory parameters. But what was really striking was that they had uh, the symptoms of the disease for a longer period of time. And this is an important point when you consider using the seraph for this indication. Um, um, and um, uh, this paper actually puts it all into perspective. It's a, a nice study uh, just published that reports on the viral clearance. And what you can appreciate here is that there is viremia present for a long period of time. And it takes about 15 days before viremia clear, uh, is cleared. 
And this is actually the time frame where it makes sense to think about the seraph because once viremia is cleared, um, uh, it, uh, at least the viral removal uh, cannot happen anymore. Um, when you look at uh, uh, multivariate analysis uh, of our data, you can see that it really makes a difference when you start the treatment in uh, reference to the ICU admission. If you start uh, within 60 hours uh, after ICU admission, you have a better outcome as compared to patients that start uh, seraph treatment after uh, 60 hours. And uh, this is a visual summary of that, uh, of that uh, uh, study. And um, uh, um, I refer you to the full NDT paper in the interest of time. Of course, it was not prospectively randomized. And we could also uh, only compare mortality to the calculated mortality, uh, either by the SOFA score, which is not ideal in this setting, or much more ideal in, in non-ventilated patients to the 4C score. And there we saw um, a markedly reduced mortality compared to the 4C score uh, calculated uh, mortality. And within that registry, the seraph was used in many different uh, ways, either at intermittent uh, treatment or as prolonged intermittent or continuous treatment up to 24 hours either standalone or in conjunction with intermittent hemodialysis, um, uh, SLED or CVVH. So pretty much everything that is uh, uh, doable with uh, the seraph. The Purify Ops uh, study uh, was a study that was published um, uh, preprint before our study, and it compared 61 seraph treated patients to 84 historical controls. And they did see a marked reduction of mortality in this um, non prospective but um, uh, historical control um, uh, based study. And um, uh, Kevin Chung, who was really instrumental in getting this study done, uh, Twittered a uh, um, uh, short time ago that, that uh, the peer reviewed paper will come out soon. So please stay tuned for that. And you should also stay tuned for other um, uh, clinical trials with the SARAF a multi-center uh, trial with, um, uh, funded by the Department of Defense will uh, look at uh, patients um, um, uh, with sepsis. Uh, we have a prospective randomized trial going on in patients with COVID-19. So there's more uh, to wait for. So uh, don't we have something similar uh, like uh, the Seraph already? Uh, I mean, we have so many cartridges and filters and stuff. Uh, why do we need a new thing? Well, the, the answer is pretty simple. The Seraph is a leak of their own. Um, uh, it's the first um, uh, in-class device and cannot be compared with the Toramixin or with the Cytosorb. Um, and it is also best used at a different time during the disease. The seraph is not meant for the patient in um, an in, uh, incredible cytokine storm in week three of a disease. It's aimed um, at the patient in the very early phase of uh, a severe uh, bacteremia or viremia. And that should be pointed out. So I think in summary, uh, we have um, a lot of great uh, uh, tools in our tool belt. We have anti-infective drugs. We have supported uh, supportive treatment. And I think um, the seraph will add to the armamentarium. And if we really do need to do an emergency break uh, in the case of uh, infection, we should combine the seraph with uh, anti-infective drugs. And I'm really looking forward to the results of prospective randomized trials, uh, because those, as uh, Professor Rimle pointed out, are needed to make your mind and our mind up 
and decide whether or not this will be a, a regular treatment in our ICUs. And with that, um, I'm happy to hopefully have triggered some questions here. Well, thank you very much, Jan, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, as I said before, we are going to answer the question that we already have from the audience a little bit later after the talk of Celine, because the talks are very related to each other. So now I'm going to ask Celine to give her talk uh, about uh, her experience with this uh, new blood purification device. And then we're going to keep, as we said before, uh, 15 minutes for, uh, I hope, a, a very interesting discussion. Celine, you can give your talk. Yes, so hello. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with uh, Professor Kilstein and Professor Rimley and all of uh, the extra team. So my talk will be more practical and I still don't have the control. Yes, I have it now. Thank you. So this high mark disclosures. Uh, as Thomas, uh, Professor Rimley already explained, uh, this is the very important thing. Sepsis is a dysregulated host response to infection. So everything is said in the definition of sepsis is that to have sepsis, you need to have an infection with a pathogen, but this is not enough. You also need to have the dysregulated host response to infection. So the pathogen will activate the leukocytes and leukocytes will uh, release in the blood uh, cytokines. And this uh, massive release of cytokines at the beginning of the, the septic shock is the so-called cytokinic storm. And it will lead to the organ dysfunction and damage of cells. And this is the vicious circle of the septic shock. So what do we have to, to fight against sepsis? Of course, the first uh, and the mandatory uh, treatment is uh, antimicrobials and nothing will re replace antimicrobials. Source control, it is mandatory and some source control are obvious and surgical, like for intra-abdominal infection. But when you have a vascular infection or bacteremia, you have less options. Restore immune homeostasis. So that is the point of blood purification therapies. So these are the classic targets for the blood purification therapies, the pathogen associated molecular patterns such as endotoxins and the cytokines. And the devices that we, we have uh, to, to remove uh, these targets will be either hemoperfusion cartridge, but also uh, enhanced uh, hemofilters, such as the high cutoff hemofilter or highly adsorptive hemofilter. We have nothing here that targets the very first uh, element of the sepsis, the pathogen itself. And this is the point of the seraph. It's to target the pathogen itself. So um, this is the main uh, player of the sepsis. You can remove the pathogen from the blood, so decrease the bacterial load, act on the source control kind of, uh, of way, but also by removing the pathogen and the bacteria from the blood, you will probably decrease the activation and the overwhelmed activation of the immune system. So uh, this was already presented by Professor Kirchstein, but the CRF 100 is uh, really um, inspired by nature. We have on our endothelium the glycocalyx, and glycocalyx is composed of glycosaminoglycans, uh, such as the heparin sulfate, and pathogens, bacteria, viruses, have this amazing ability to bind to the glycosaminoglycans and heparin sulfate. It's their way for cell invasion. And 
Seraf 100 mimics this property by using heparin, which shares this ability to bind the pathogens like heparin sulfite. So heparin is a coven is a bind on beads that are packed inside the cartridge. And when the blood flows through the cartridge, the pathogens that are inside the blood will be able to be absorbed inside the cartridge. And they are not further released in the circulation. So what kind of uh, pathogens can the CRF100 remove? It can remove many pathogens, everything that we could be worrying about, such as gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, but also, and very interestingly, drug-resistant bacteria. So this is a major help when we are to treat a patient with a drug-resistant bacteria. We, of course, have to try to have the best uh, antimicrobial regimen, but sometimes this is not enough. So if we can have an adjuvant therapy and decrease the bacterial load, this is a major help. Um, <clears throat> More recently, uh, CERAF-100 was also shown to be able to remove uh, SARS-CoV-2 and mainly nucleocapsid proteins from the virus. So this was already presented previously. I will not talk so long about that. But I will present you two clinical cases that we conducted in our department. And it is the occasion for us to speak a little bit more about the treatment and to, to discuss the technical uh, aspects. So this first case, it's a patient that is uh, 60 years old. He has hypertension and stage renal disease. Uh, he's under peritoneal dialysis at home, and he presents with fever and asthenia for one week. So he consults in the emergency department. He has obviously sepsis with a very, very high procalcitonin level. He has a low mean arterial pressure, a heart, high heart rate, and even with the, the fluid, this doesn't improve. So this patient is referred to our intensive care unit for septic shock. When he arrived, we start antibiotic very quickly, uh, vancomycin and ceftazidim regarding his previous bacterial history. Uh, but also this is uh, not enough. So very quickly, we have to start with uh, vasopressors. Because this patient has end-stage renal disease, we know that he will require renal replacement therapy. So we start continuous renal replacement therapy because of his um, hemodynamic uh, failure. And in this CRT, we will uh, also put a CRAF 100 hemoperfusion cartridge because we have a high uh, suspicion of bacteremia. At this time, we don't know he has bacteremia, but it's a suspicion. The patient will improve very quickly and he will be uh, referred to the nephrology ward at day five and at home at day 18. So it was a, a good improvement for a patient that had a very bad uh, presentation at the beginning. Here you can see the norepinephrine and vasopressor requirements of this patient. And very shortly, his history. So he read in the ward here, we, we have the blood sample and the blood culture. We start antibiotics straight after uh, blood uh, culture. And two hours later, we start CVHD and CRF100. When we start CRF100, the patient stabilize and then norepinephrine decrease. And here, more than 12 hours later, the lab call to say blood culture are positive. So obviously when we start CRF100 here, we do not know that blood culture will be positive. This patient had uh, actually endocarditis. Uh, we didn't uh, know that at the very beginning, but we had very, very fast, we, we had this suspicion with the, the transthoracic echography. So I told you that we inserted the CRF100 cartridge inside the CRT. So this is how we do um, in our department in, Crete, in, uh, in the ICU. We use CVVHD with uh, citrate calcium uh, 
regional anticoagulation. And actually, we have uh, very good uh, outcomes and it works very well with the CIRAF. We can either uh, put the cartridge when the treatment is already started, or we can insert the cartridge before starting the treatment. Both are working. And as you can see, when we insert the cartridge during the treatment, we observe this little increase in the pre-filter pressure, which, uh, which is expected, but then uh, we have a stabilization of the pressure. We observed uh, no modification of our citrate uh, calcium parameters, and we, we had no problems of uh, earlier failure of the circuits. So here, the cartridge is between the blood pump and the hemofilter. Another option, if you don't uh, have an indication for renal replacement therapy, is to do the treatment as hemoperfusion, uh, as a standalone treatment, without the renal replacement therapy. But for this, you need to insert the dialysis catheter and to have an anticoagulation, of course. <clears throat> So technical aspects to begin in the ICU, if you are not used with the hemoperfusion, uh, you have to have a protocol, of course, which uh, precise the patient selection. And patient selection for this kind of treatment is a very uh, key point. Uh, we already discussed it before, but we will speak again about it. Uh, as you see this patient, we had suspicion of bacteremia, but we didn't wait for the blood culture to be positive. Otherwise, maybe it's too late. So how to insert the cartridge? Because it's very easy. So this uh, technical point should not be uh, uh, a problem. And you should not do, not do the treatment because of this technical point. Uh, teach and train the team, and for us, we we had a very good uh, feeling with the nurses. They were they are very they think the treatment is very easy to do, and since it's not uh, modifying any way our RT treatment, it's uh, all right. And then, of course, when you are ready, you need to find a good patient for this treatment. So the good patient for this treatment, uh, as you may imagine, the perfect patient is a patient with bacteremia since it's the main uh, target of the CIRAF. Decreasing the bacterial blood load is a, a treatment uh, target. And here you can see that when you have uh, a very low time to positivity of blood culture, which is uh, correlating to a high bacterial load, hospital mortality is increased and you have also more septic shock. So the time to positivity of the blood culture will be a good indicator of the severity of disease. Here on the left side, you can see in this study that not only the first uh, time to positivity is important, but this, the kinetics and the evolution of uh, this time to positivity is also important. When the second blood culture that you will do is still uh, very has still a very short time to positivity, then it's not good. In this study, the patient that were died, they had more uh, blood, second blood culture still under 12 hours. So it means that in this group of patients, uh, we cannot, we don't decrease the bacterial blood load and it is associated with worst outcomes. So bacteremic patients, are a very good target for treating with CERAF, and you should probably start the treatment before uh, obtaining the blood culture. Otherwise, maybe you are still late. We will then see this second case. It's a post-operative uh, peritonitis, intra-abdominal infection. This is a patient 74 years old with hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and also chronic kidney disease. He undergoes a colectomy for a carcinoma, and at day four, he, has a, he developed a septic shock. So he's taken for a CT. Uh, we diagnose post-operative peritonitis, so patient is uh, going again for surgery, and then ICU admission. At ICU admission, the patient already has a multi-organ failure with a very important microcirculatory dysfunction. He has high 
plate type level. And of course, some tumor microbials were already started during the surgery. And we also start supportive measures such as a CRT in the ICU. The patient will initially recover uh, his uh, wind of uh, vasopressor after 48 hours and extubated at day four. Unfortunately, he does again uh, abdominal complication with digestive perforation and this patient will not survive. So here, uh, this is the, in the blue line is the vasopressor requirement of this patient. And as you can see, uh, he has the antibiotics during the surgery. He arrives in the, in the ICU less than two hours after, and we start CVHD very quickly. He has a very important microcirculatory dysfunction, uh, high SCVO2, high lactate. And for this patient, uh, the, because the septic shock was very important, we thought that maybe he could have bacteremia. And we were also very early in the disease because uh, the, um, the beginning of the septic shock uh, was mainly during the surgery when he started to be extremely uh, vasopressor dependent. So because we were early in the septic shock and we had the high suspicion of bacteremia, we started also seraph treatment here. Uh, and we had a stabilization of the, the vasopressor requirements. However, for this patient, blood culture remained negative before and after the seraph treatment. So of course, this is a clinical case, so the point is not to draw conclusions about one case, but just to, to have a discussion around it. We have negative blood culture, so should we say that it was totally useless to use the Seraph 100, or maybe is there still a place for this, uh, this patient? I would not say that we have to use Seraph 100 in negative blood culture patients, of course, but because we use it before, uh, sometimes having the results of the blood culture, some patients will be like this patient. And this is the occasion for us to discuss that maybe CRF100 could also remove something else than pathogens from the blood. And in this uh, experiment, it's an animal experiment, and it was baboons that were inoculated in their um, bronchia with uh, pneumococcia. Uh, so they developed uh, pneumonia, and there were then uh, uh, purificate with either a sham device or the CRF100. And as you can see, this patient, they have um, uh, bacterial DNA in the blood. And this bacterial DNA uh, was removed efficiently by the CRF100. So this is very interesting because here uh, the um, blood cultures are negative because patients, the, the sorry, patients, the animals already received antimicrobials. So we have negative blood cultures. However, there is DNA in the blood. And this DNA is a PAMS and can activate the immune uh, inflammation and dysregulation. So here, as you can see, the removal of the, the bacterial DNA uh, could be maybe also a uh, help for, as an adjunctive therapy. CRF100 for cytokine removal, it is not the main point of the device, uh, but we already explained to you that um, there is uh, this heparin sulfide that is a, a glycosaminoglycan that you can also find at the surface of the endothelium. And uh, this endothelium uh, in, the, in humans has many properties but also it has uh, inflammatory and immunomodulative properties and can bind to some cytokines. Um, and so CRF100 also has this property maybe to bind some cytokines such as this TNF alpha and vascular cell adhesion molecules. It can uh, be described as a artificial endothelium. So maybe this could also be of interest and it should be studied further. So we say that, sorry, CRF100 is removing pathogen. It's the main point of the device, but also maybe pathogen associated molecular patterns, maybe some cytokines of interest in the septic shock. And 
also what we do not want to remove. And I see that some of you are interested by these precise points and you are totally right. We are treating patients with sepsis. And of course, we absolutely not want to remove antimicrobials from the blood. So this is an in vitro study. And they used plasma and they observed the reduction ratio of uh, numerous antimicrobials with seraph. And what you can see here is that uh, the antimicrobials that are maybe the mostly absorbed by the cartridge are aminosides, gentamicin and tobramycin here. So, of course, as every time you use a CRT or renal replacement therapy with hemofilter, you have to do a therapeutic drug monitoring to be sure that your patients receive the appropriate uh, dose of antibiotics, antimicrobials. However, with CRF100, the treatment is short, um, even though you can use the, the cartridge for longer. Uh, it is um, mainly used for short period of time, four to six hours. So when you are the very early phase of septic shock, of course, you cannot delay uh, the, the, the required antibiotics. But if you are at the later phase, maybe you can delay it for four hours. Of course, not at the beginning. Uh, also, you do therapeutic drug monitoring, so this should not be a problem. So finally, to start with a CRAF 100 session, you, have, you need to have a suspicion of bacteremia. This is the, the main point. And either because you have a disease that will lead to bacteremia, such as endocard endocarditis, catheter-related bloodstream infection, or maybe particular infections, such as vascular sepsis, fistula infection, or because you have a septic shock with a high suspicion of associated bacteria, like our patient that had intra-abdominal infection and was extremely uh, shocked. Do not wait for positive blood culture if you have this high suspicion because it would be maybe too late for the treatment. Uh, monitor the efficacy of the treatment. So do you increase your time to positivity or even better have negative blood culture, hemodynamic improvement, and also maybe a respiratory improvement. Control the treatment dose. So treatment dose is the amount of blood that you will treat with the, the session. So it depends on the blood flow rate and the treatment duration. And maybe if necessary, you can repeat the treatment. So this is my last words. Historic targets for extracorporeal blood purification include cytokines and endotoxins, but CRAF100 is different. It's capable of removing pathogens from the blood, so it acts as a decrease of the bacterial load and help maybe to control the source of infection within its intravascular. Uh, it's also prevent from the activation of the dysregulated immune uh, response. You can use it either as a standalone therapy or inside a CRT circuit or RRT. And so maybe in the future, it has a place to help to treat extensively drug-resistant bacteria. And this is all, thank you. Thank you very much, Celine, for uh, your talk. Um, so uh, now it's, um, it's uh, 5 p.m., so we're gonna take 15 to 20 minutes to uh, discuss with our two experts for uh, today. You have two options to ask questions for the experts. The Q&A uh, option on uh, the Zoom software and the chat. So please don't hesitate to ask your questions. We can uh, relay the questions. There are actually um, uh, several questions on uh, the timing, uh, Jan. And Celine, I think Jan, you said that it's, and Celine also echoed this, that you uh, explained that it's very interesting with the seraph to start as early as possible uh, before the cytokine storm, like you said, uh, uh, Jan, uh, I think uh, this is a good point, but uh, the clinicians can tell you that, uh, okay, this is also interesting uh, when you have positive blood cultures and, when we start very early, we do not have the results of the cultures. Does it mean that we are going to use the CRF in 
uh, several cases for uh, nothing because they will be uh, not, we, we, we all know that we have negative blood cultures in many cases. So how do you re reconcile these two, uh, these two things? Well, I think that there, there are two, uh, two parts of that answer. Number one, if, if you are threatened by somebody with a gun in their head, hand, uh, you don't wait uh, for verification that this is not a toy gun. You assume it's a real one and you act accordingly. And I think in fulminant infections, we should not gamble and think, well, hopefully it's not a positive blood culture that comes back. So this is more of a philosophical view on, on, on severe bloodstream infections. I mean, we, we, we are talking about critically ill patients here. We are not talking about normal ward and uh, diabetic foot syndrome or something like that in the early phase. Number two, we have more and more smart, very early, sometimes point of care devices that tell us before the uh, uh, blood culture comes back uh, positive that there is a bacterial or viral infection going on. And the seraph is a treatment now that will last, you know, for many years and, and the future to come and the future of, um, uh, of, of uh, proving bloodstream infections will not be the, um, the blood culture. Uh, the future of proving bloodstream infections will be PCR tests uh, and other smart point of care devices. So, so I think uh, we should, uh, we should uh, keep that in mind. Um, um, and of course, sometimes, um, and we do the same thing with antibiotics, right? I mean, we give a calculated antibiotic treatment. We're not waiting in a severely ill patient for the blood culture to come back and tell us which uh, antibiotic we're, we're giving. And uh, well, you know, if you can save lives, well, then use um, antibiotics or the seraph uh, every now and then um, in a patient that uh, afterwards uh, 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 doesn't need it. Then you can play the Monday morning quarterback and be ultra smart on that. Um, so, so this is my view on on um, the waiting for for the blood culture. If you have, when you look at the data, what you can appreciate is that um, severe infections or mortality increases when the blood culture comes back anything between 12 and 24 hours after sending it in. So what we are talking about is how do you respond to a blood culture with a short time to positivity? And again, we're not talking about blood culture coming back after seven days being positive, but after one day. And I think that is still a time frame where the addition of the seraph uh, to anti-infective treatment really makes sense. I, I was maybe a little bit exaggerating uh, with the early because I think if you think about the cytosol, it's too late for the seraph. And if you uh, choose seraph, it's too early for the cytosol. Um, I mean, th these are completely different things. You pump blood through both of them but that's about uh, um, uh, what they have in common. Uh, everything else in terms of how they work and how they, uh, in which phase of the disease they should be used, they're completely on, on the opposite sides of, of, a, of a big spectrum. Thank you, Jan. I think it's important for the audience to understand the differences between all these devices that are now available in 722. And you made a, a, a good point explaining that. Celine, if, uh, if I ask you in, in a few seconds to uh, summarize in a practical way how you use the seraph, what's the blood flow, what's the duration of the station, how many stations, and um, how would you uh, respond to that? Yes, <clears throat> so um, for us, we use it uh, 
in our CRT treatment. So blood flow is uh, it's CVVHD that we do, so continuous uh, venovenous dialysis, hemodialysis. So we have low blood flow, uh, around 100 to 120 uh, milliliter per minute. And um, we use the cartridge for four to six hours. Up to now, we had a, either a good outcome with the first treatment, so we didn't repeat the session or the patient was uh, already uh, not anymore uh, able to receive this kind of treatment because uh, the, the patient was died before being able to have a second session. So uh, for now, we had only one session. However, I think, uh, Maybe if uh, we had patients that uh, were still uh, with bacteremia after the first session and still in our ICU, we would uh, go for a second session. It was ex the, the first patient with the endocarditis was typical like this. Uh, so he had a very fast improvement. However, he remained uh, with positive blood culture. So maybe if he had still been in the ICU, we'll have uh, done a second session. Thank you, for you. Um, yeah. Yes, right. and right. as I said previously, we use a regional citrate calcium anticoagulation and we use exactly the same parameter as usually. And from what we observed, there is no modification of, uh, of our treatments with the CIRAF 100. Yeah, and do you have the same practice? Do you, do you use it a little bit differently? Like a duration well, of treatment? Yeah. Blood yeah, we, we, we came to, uh, uh, to appreciate uh, the versatility of the SARAF. I mean, it, it really, we, we, we use the whole spectrum, intermittent, short term, four hours. We do a lot of sled, so we use it uh, sometimes for uh, six to 12 hours, but we also include it into a CVH circuit. And um, uh, one um, uh, a person from the audience asked whether or not there would be a danger to spill back bacteria if you use it up to 24 hours. So we, we, we did uh, uh, examine that uh, in depth um, uh, together with our um, Institute for Infection Research here in Braunschweig, and we couldn't detect any threat uh, all the way to 24 hours. Um, so I don't know what happens above and beyond 24 hours. And uh, we, we don't use it for longer than 24 hours, but until that point in time, at least for Steph Aureus, and this is what we tested, we, we don't see any uh, signal of harm and the efficacy. This is really amazing. I mean, we challenged the Seraph with industrial doses of Steph Aureus in the lab over and over and over and over again, and it, Every time it absorbs um, uh, the 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 staff. Wait, correct. Uh, I share in the in the chat. So, um, I think that that's the only the difference. We dare to use it all the way to twenty four hours. Okay, Jan. Uh, thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience is, uh, we have a question, how, I think this is for <clears throat> Jan, how do you see the seraph applied to the treatment of long COVID? Well, this is an interesting question. Uh, we have a lot of uh, people inquiring about long COVID. And at first I thought, you know, this doesn't really make sense, except for the few cases where you have persistent bacteremia. But then publications came out showing that there is uh, there are microclots in long COVID patients, and they are all um, uh, pathophysiologically related to serum uh, amyloid A, um, and together with von Willebrand and, and with fibrinogen, they form those um, um, uh, those microclots. And this is very reminiscent to the acute phase where you, I mean, when you pipette the blood of a COVID patient yourself, you, 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 can, you can appreciate the jelly or syrup-like structure of, of, the, uh, of the blood in those patients. Um, and um, so there, there are data that suggest that um, it should be investigated. Uh, but uh, I will be 
crystal clear about that. I think especially long COVID is something where a lot of people are doing a lot of BS. And I think what we need to do is uh, when we have a pathophysiological idea and we have a device, we need to document um, and register every single treatment and collect and analyze the data. I just hate the idea that there are people out there just using this and that device. And, and uh, I encounter a lot of uh, patients that pay cash, enormous amount of cash for insane treatments here in Germany. Uh, and uh, I, I don't like that at all. So I think there is uh, a rationale to use the Seraph. And if people use the Seraph for long COVID, they should, uh, th that treatment attempt should be accompanied with uh, monitoring both on the um, patient side and on the blood side. And nobody should do that without, without collecting data. Okay, and thank you very much. Um, Celine, we have a, a question for you because you mentioned uh, CDVHD. You said you use a Seraph with CDVHD, but I think uh, Federico is asking for more uh, information here. Could we use the Seraph with CDVH? Could we use, I think you said that, but can you repeat? Could you use the Seraph as a standalone therapy? CDVH, CDVHDF, what do you think? Yes, um, yes, absolutely. I think you totally can use the Seraph with CVH. Uh, it's uh, not a problem and you should have the same uh, very good stability and results as with CVHD. And why do we use uh, CVHD more than uh, CVH and what this patient here received CVHD? It's um, because it was, uh, this patient were at risk for citrate accumulation our, uh, our habits in uh, the department of the, the, the world is to use CVHD in this situation to have a lower uh, blood flow. But I think you can also perfectly use CVH uh, for, for the seraph treatment. And, and also hemoperfusion as a standalone therapy. Uh, if you have no indication from renal replacement therapy, it's even better, of course, because as you know, there is a, it's, not a good idea to, to do RRT to a patient that doesn't require uh, renal replacement therapy. So if you have no reason for RRT, then prefer hemoperfusion as standalone for sure. And also I just would like to add something more uh, is concerning the timing. When you use uh, the seraph in septic shock, of course you do not wait for positive blood culture. It's like for antibiotics. You do not wait for antibiotics to, for blood culture results to start antimicrobials in a septic shock patient. However, it doesn't mean that um, when you have positive blood culture later on, uh, you cannot start the treatment. Uh, you can start uh, antimicrobials when you have positive, um, uh, positive blood culture even if the patient, you should start it, even if the patient is not shocked. So what I mean when I say that you have to start it uh, as early as possible, does not mean that uh, when you have positive blood culture later on, you should not start it. I mean that in the context of the shock septic, uh, you have to start it even if it's only a suspicion, like for antimicrobials. Okay, thank you, Celine. Uh, Jan, we have a lot of uh, German colleagues online, and some of them are asking, uh, what's the cost of uh, the Seraph in Germany? Uh, how is it reimbursed in Germany? Is it reimbursed, and how much is it reimbursed? Could you say uh, some few words about this? Yeah, the, the beauty is uh, I, I, can't, uh, I can't say numbers. I can't, uh, I will say that uh, we um, get it reimbursed as hemoperfusion. Hemoperfusion is a treatment code that needs to be individually negotiated by every hospital. Um, so the reimbursement rate differs from hospital to hospital. Uh, but uh, if you have uh, that, re uh, that uh, hemoperfusion code negotiated, that uh, will uh, almost cover uh, your your cost of the seraph. 
but I know that there are some hospitals that have not negotiated the hemoperfusion code for their hospital. Uh, so that's uh, then on the to-do list, uh, if you will. Um, and I, I don't know about other countries. I think the reimbursement uh, is different from country to country. Um, what really has to be taken into consideration, uh, especially at a time where we have um, a resource constrained environment during the peaks of COVID, um, then of course, one way to look at the Seraph is how much do I get reimbursed? The other way to look at it is, do I prevent people from progressing to uh, the need of being intubated? Or can I wean patients off the ventilator earlier with the seraph? So then you kind of have a full cost analysis or a full resource analysis uh, available. And, um, uh, and I think that, um, uh, uh, we, we, will, we will need to wait for um, the analysis of all the studies I mentioned uh, to take this part into consideration. Because if you can prevent uh, intubation in a single patient, I mean, that in, in the, you know, looking at the whole cost uh, within your healthcare system, that's an achievement um, uh, to have. And if, it, if this saves your last, uh, respirator bed that's even better. Thank you, Jan. We still have a couple of minutes. So if you have the last questions, uh, please do not hesitate. There were a few questions about the, um, the antibiotic removal. Uh, what, what about the studies uh, looking at this? Are they very robust? Do we have robust data telling us that uh, Seraf is very safe regarding the antibiotics uh, removal? Maybe Celine, you can start, and then uh, Jan. Um, we have uh, mainly in vitro data, but also some in vivo data. And in vitro data, as I show you, uh, it was with uh, plasma that was uh, running through the, the Seraph cartridge and showing very low reduction ratio of most of the antibiotics. So this is a very um, uh, comforting uh, data. However, of course, uh, it's very depending on the patients. And I think the best thing you have to do is to do therapeutic drug monitoring. And <clears throat> regarding the, the blood flow you use, how long you use the cartridge, uh, what is the, the blood uh, volume that is treated. Of course, this is also uh, important. So in, uh, in vivo, there is less data. However, the, the ones that are uh, available and uh, they're also showing very low levels of removal of the drugs. And there is also something with the, um, the immunosuppressive drugs. I think uh, maybe Professor Kirstein uh, knows this one uh, very well. Uh, with the patient that was uh, with the graft, uh, renal kidney graft, and you you were you measured the immunosuppressive drugs in this patient. So. Yeah, so so uh, I, I can I can just uh, um, uh, underline that um, removal. Um, I mean, if you look at data on removal of anti-infective drugs during extracorporeal treatment, this is a, <laughs> this is a really interesting thing to do because for most of our antibiotics, we don't have up-to-date data. The uh, amount of data we have on the seraph is um, uh, is um, currently in my view sufficient uh, to um, to operate it and um, uh, I'm um, uh, comforted by the fact that so far all the in vitro data that had been obtained uh, were confirmed uh, by the users uh, that either have already published uh, uh, case reports that like the one Celine just mentioned from, from uh, the Netherlands or that communicated that on, on a personal level uh, to me. So I don't see any 
uh, any danger. I mean, we 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 looked at remdesivir uh, in in vivo in patients. We looked at hydroxychloroquine um, a long time ago because we thought it might be beneficial to to give that. So no signal whatsoever that that drugs are removed, uh, with the only exception of um, aminoglycosides. And I think for that. The uh, therapeutic drug monitoring is um, is uh, available everywhere, and uh, although I do agree with Celine, it would be great to measure all the antibiotics. I think we are a long way uh, 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 away from from that point. Um, that's that's a different webinar. Uh, how to you know how to dose uh, antibiotics right in um, in extracorporeal treatment. Yes. I I think first in the ICU, when we use a CRRT, uh, most of the antimicrobials uh, problem will not uh, be associated with the seraph adsorption, but with the hemofilter and the duration of our CRRT. So um, anyway, seraph or not, when for this patient, we have to, to try to optimize the treatment. And of course, therapeutic drug monitoring, we have the, the same here. Sometimes we have... Uh, the results of the, the monitoring very late. But however, uh, the more we do, the more we have uh, the, the data, so it will help to adapt for the future patients. So even though if sometimes it's taking long, we still should do it uh, to have uh, uh, many data regarding our hemofilters and the situation of the patients. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Celine. Maybe we have, uh, yeah, we have uh, maybe the last question uh, from Carlo. Uh, using SRAF with a high cut of filter during a, a CRT, it could widen the action spectrum. Are uh, there any results with this configuration? I mean, yeah, the question may basically could be a little bit wider. Uh, do you have an experience like, um, uh, to combine different blood purification devices like Seraph plus another blood purification device, um, Celine and Jan. Mm. We did this, so we combined already two blood purification devices in the same time. So exactly like this situation, a Seraph plus high cut of uh, hemofilter. Uh, yes, it uh, it widens the, the the spectrum of action, but the point is not the same. Seraph is to first point first aim of Seraph is for pathogens removal, and maybe if it can also remove some interesting cytokines or PAMs, it's it's uh, add on uh, property that is still very interesting, but it's not the main point here. And uh, high cut of filter, it's to remove uh, cytokines in this situation. So yes, maybe uh, the association of both will be of interest. And that's what we did in the clinical cases that I presented to you. We also have uh, an experience of associating uh, blood purification devices, but in time as sequential treatments. We had a patient, uh, it was a COVID patient that received first CRF treatment. Uh, for because this patient uh, had a viremia, and then uh, in a second time, we switched for cytosorb treatment uh, for the the more um, cytokinic part of the the septic shock. So yes, I think it's a it's a possibility since you since these uh, treatments have different uh, main targets, you can uh, combine them. It depends yeah. on what you want to do. <laughs> Jan, do you agree? Do you combine sometimes your uh, blood pressure devices? Do you use the SERAF with another kind of uh, blood pressure device? Um, yeah, I mean, we um, we we, we sometimes in, in COVID patients we we um, uh, sometimes use several devices in uh, in one patient, but not at the same time, because in 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 my view, as I said. Uh, um, uh, if, if you aim for pathogen removal, it's usually not the time to counteract uh, cytokines um, or to do other things. But, but of course, uh, it, it, technically speaking, 
I mean, you could you could treat one patient uh, with ECMO, uh, seraph, other adsorbers, and do plasma exchange at the same time. Um, so um, uh, I think that the the important point is some extracorporeal devices um, uh, really cause trouble when they are operated. Um, the seraph is a plug and play device, so the seraph is really uh, is is really very forgiving and um, doesn't do alarms and and things like that. So from that perspective, it's um, uh, it's a device that can be easily combined with other devices because it uh, the seraph itself does not cause any any trouble in terms of putting it into the circulation or in terms of um, uh, uh, causing clotting or um, in terms of um, uh, interfering uh, with other devices. So, so um, if, if people want to combine, that's technically not a problem uh, whatsoever. I mean, we, we, you know, we, we started with charcoal. If, I don't know how many people still use charcoal, but when I remember um, charcoal tended to, to clot after two, two and a half, three hours, um, uh, you know, you, you had a decrease in platelets, you had uh, uh, a lot of trouble, hypothermia, you had low uh, calcium levels. That's, none of those can be observed with the seraph. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, I think we need to uh, stop here. I would like to thank again very much our two uh, experts for today, Celine and Jan. I would like to thank all uh, the audience uh, from uh, colleagues from all over the world. The discussion was very interesting. And of course, I would like to thank again uh, Extera Medical for organizing this uh, very interesting uh, symposium. And with that, I would like to wish you a very good evening to all of you. Bye-bye and thank you. <laughs>